Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Malio Christopher and Toll Tribal Marijuana Webinar. I'm your host and your moderator, Jeffrey Nelson, and I'm looking forward to walking through this very interesting topic with you today. It's titled Cutting Through the Smoke, and we hope to give you a clear-headed view of all the different obstacles, new opportunities, issues to watch as we go forward in this, uh, in this growing industry. If you're watching on June 2nd, then you're live, and we welcome you to use your Q&A to uh, pose questions that we'll try to get to by the end of the, end of the webinar. But you know, I've been practicing Indian law here in Washington, DC for over 20 years now. And this is a really exciting time uh, in the field for a number of different reasons that you're probably well aware of. And one of them is this very topic, this, 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 uh, this new industry that we are witnessing and uh, this interesting legal landscape that some tribes are, are uh, trying to navigate. Um, it is just like in many areas of Indian law, one where you have to worry about three levels of government, federal, state, and tribal, and they don't always line up with one another. In a matter of fact, of course, in this area, we have the federal law that makes it impossible to line up uh, with a legitimate industry at this point. We'll cover a little bit more about that later. Um, but I'm excited to be joined by two of our Indian law group attorneys out of uh, the Seattle office of MCT Law. And it's great to have them uh, from Washington State because Washington is the state with probably the most experience in this field, having uh, legalized and uh, licensed marijuana use uh, back in 2012. And so I'm going to turn it over to Sophie and Kale to introduce themselves before we get into this a little bit more. Sophie, why don't you go first? Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to say hello to you from a beautiful sunny day here in the Northwest. I am a fairly new attorney at Malio, Christopher and Toll. Before I came here, I actually lived and worked in New Mexico for eight years. For three years, I was at UNM Law. And then five years after that, I worked as a public defender and then uh, for Pegasus Legal Services for Children. And in that job, I got to work with tribal governments and their child welfare systems and with the state ICWA court. And one reason I'm so excited to talk about our topic today is because in my job working with tribal governments and their various departments, I saw that the tribes that were able to control their own economic enterprises and really reinvest in their own communities were really successful in supporting their people. They were able to have control over the decisions and implement things how they wanted to and be really creative about how they went about their social functions. So I think cannabis is really an opportunity for tribes to have control of their economic destinies. And I look forward to talking about it today. Thanks, Sophie. Um, that's great to hear about uh, a little bit of your experience. Um, my name is Kale Van Winkle. I am one of the other attorneys in the Indian Law Practice Group here at MCT Law. And uh, before joining MCT Law, I was actually an in-house attorney for the Soxhawatl Indian Tribe here in Washington State. And during my time there, I got to do a little bit of everything, as uh, any in-house attorneys watching may uh, know a little bit about. But one of the projects that I'm most proud of at that time was helping to get uh, Soxhawatl's marijuana dispensary up and running through uh, regulatory work and uh, business development. So that was really a, a great opportunity that uh, I got to see a little bit more about the marijuana industry kind of at the ground level and work with the tribe to get a successful operation up and running. And one of the things that I'm really excited to share with all of you who are watching this webinar is um, to get to the opportunity to hear from some of the tribes here in Washington state who have entered the cannabis space and have successful operations up and running. So we've put together a little package where some of the tribal leaders and tribal operators here in Washington state will get the chance to share their experiences with you and talk about what brought them into the space and how things are going here. So we're going to take a brief pause from listening to us to get to hear from some tribal leaders, and uh, we'll be right back.
our tribe, like many in Indian country, has a very high interest in uh, diversifying its economic portfolio um, to become more self-reliant. When the cannabis became legal in Washington State, uh, many of our sister tribes took off on it right away, uh, developed a, uh, a negotiated and uh, developed a compact with the state to, to engage in the industry. And we saw that it was quite successful. Uh, we basically reached out to them and, and got advice on how was it working. And they said, absolutely, very well, very profitable. And uh, so then we said, okay, we're in. And as you can well imagine, the younger sector said, yeah, absolutely. Actually, they didn't even blink. Uh, the older sector who still have um, uh, the elders the, uh, the, who still think uh, cannabis leads to heroin. Um, and so the, they still think that that is, a, a, is legitimate. Um, and so that, that was very troubling uh, for some, not everybody. It was a small sector and we had to persuade them that it, it was a good thing. I think we make a good impression once you walk through the front door. So that makes a difference. You know, if, if one had a preconceived notion about what a, a pop store might look like, it's not what they see when they walk in our front door. We have the average Jane and Joe. That, that is our average customer, is your average person that you might meet anywhere in society. Um, for any one hippie, or, or stoner looking person that, that might fit a stereotype walking through our doors. We have five or 10 people of every other walk of life you could imagine. Um, I don't think, I, I think the regulations that surround the industry and the, re, and the regulatory requirements that we uh, agree to with the compact um, protects uh, any of that um, un, unacceptable element uh, to be, have, have any part of our uh, industry. They have to, the, the distributors, uh, the, uh, uh, all the vendors that we do business with, they, they all have to have licenses to do business in Washington state. So it's very similar to the gaming industry. You can't come into this, this state and do business with the tribes or anybody else unless, unless you, uh, you have a license that has been credentialed, so to speak, if I can put it that way, or had to have the background check to avoid uh, the kind of criminal element that people think about when they think of the drug industry. From a community perspective, and, and I'm not speaking as a member of the uh, Jamestown bomb community, but um, just our local uh, geographic uh, community is very small. And having an established retail uh, business here actually displaces the, the street level type of dealer. Um, they can't compete with us. Um, we're, we are very excited how successful this business has been for us over the course of uh, just a little over a year, I think. Um, and we're already uh, uh, preparing to expand. Um, so we're, we're already taking a hard look at, uh, at farming and, and growing our own as well as distributing. Uh, so that's a big deal to us. We're taking a hard look at the other options in terms of uh, uh, medicinal uh, research and uh, a medicinal um, uh, counseling services uh, for, uh, uh, I guess, holistic uh, healing um, is it probably the best way I can put it right now. So those are all uh, byproducts, or I, I shouldn't say, that those are extensions of the industry uh, that we want to be a part of. When we first opened, we were happy to be selling $5,000 worth of product a day. Like the first shoot, first six months, we were if we were breaking ten thousand in a day, we were excited. Um, here, just last month, we on four twenty, we had our busiest day in sales. We hit one hundred fifteen thousand dollars in sales in just the one day. We're now a million dollars a month in sales. I can honestly say, as a tribal member out here, we haven't seen anything really negative for an impact at all. But that's one of our big things is how much money we make off of taxes and how much that has actually helped the tribe which in turn, they put that into other programs. So, so it's money that we make is actually going back into the community. When we first were looking into getting into cannabis, there was a lot of pullback from some of our elder tribal members that they still have that stigma of the devil's lettuce, that cannabis is you know, gonna cause more issues than anything else. And a lot of them have come back to completely turn around what they were thinking and they've noticed 
the changes for the positive. It's helping people. It's it's causing more revenue for for the tribe. It opens up doors to more growth and and bigger opportunities and to help better the tribe, better the reservations. Well, we're in a very rural um, location and it was one of the only businesses we could operate that would do well in a rural setting um, where we could actually succeed and grow our tribe and actually provide some type of uh, services back to our members. And the product is right there. It's like supply and demand. You see a demand for a product in your area or something that people are going out of your area to get and in you and you have a space that you can supply it to them, then they're gonna come to you regardless. We did have some pushback and the concerns were um, with the location. The reason why we ended up moving forward with it, even with some of the pushback of the membership is because of the opportunity getting into this space. When you actually realize who's shopping at the stores, it's we don't stereotype them anymore because you see that it's just everyday people. It's no, there's not any, I don't know, weird people coming into the store, it's just everyday people. We don't have a prime location and there's not a lot of things that we can do out here. And so it can provide opportunity to your people that you may not have been able to provide before. It can bring tax revenue unlike any other businesses and the markups are crazy in the marijuana space. So you will make money even if you do the craziest discounts in the world. And um, that provides opportunity to do so many things for your people and your reservation. I would just go for it and try it out because we did it and we did it in a short amount of time and um, it's successful for us. I mean, that's fantastic. And it's hard not to be excited when you see that kind of experience, those kind of shops, that kind of uh, tribal leadership uh, taking on a new industry like that. But I've got to bring it back to that elephant in the room. We're going to talk about the fact that this is illegal. This is still illegal under federal law, right? Uh, Sophie, how is it that we are not having the world's shortest webinar when we all know that this is illegal under the Federal Controlled Substances Act? Absolutely. I'm sure many of you have heard, this shouldn't be a surprise, marijuana is illegal and actually considered by the federal government to be a highly addictive, dangerous drug with no medical or scientific value, according to the federal government. And that puts it on the Schedule One of the Controlled Substances Act in such company as other drugs of heroin, LSD, ecstasy, and actually peyote. So the federal government considers it to be a fairly serious substance. And that should be a bottom line or reminder throughout this conversation that federally speaking, marijuana is still illegal. However, you're right, this would be a rather short webinar if that's where we left it. So I want to mention two memos. One was written in 2013 by Deputy Attorney General Cole under the Obama administration in response to the legalization of marijuana under Washington State and Colorado law. And the Cole memo laid out eight marijuana federal enforcement priorities. And essentially it said, if a state is regulating marijuana and not conflicting with one of our eight priorities, federal enforcement priorities shouldn't be marijuana in those states. And we have limited resources. We should put our resources elsewhere. Then in 2014, the Wilkinson memo was issued also under the Obama administration. And under the Wilkinson memo, which was written in response to tribal questions about how marijuana would be enforced on tribal lands, there were three main lines that came from that memo. The first was that the AUSAs who were covering tribal areas, who had tribal lands under their jurisdictions, should really consult with tribes and see if enforcement was a major issue on the tribal reservations. Second, they should consult with tribes on a government to government basis. And third, and perhaps most important, is that before an AUSA made any sort of enforcement decision, 
they should confer with their higher ups and the BIA and the higher ups of the attorney general's office to make sure that enforcement action was really something that was necessary. So under the Wilkinson memo, there shouldn't really be any rogue AUSAs enforcing marijuana uh, laws without any approval from the higher ups. I do want to emphasize that neither one of these were saying that marijuana was now legal. They certainly said throughout the memos that they could enforce wherever, whenever they wanted, if they needed to, but it did indicate a shifting of priorities for the federal government away from marijuana. And so with these shifting priorities, a number of states have taken that opportunity to, uh, to enact more liberal marijuana laws, uh, allowing licensing and, and a certain limited number of sales. And the latest uh, of those states is New Mexico. So back to Sophie now with her New Mexico experience. Uh, tell us what New Mexico has done. Absolutely. Just earlier this year, the governor of New Mexico, Michelle Lujan Grisham, convened a special, special sec session to enact this legislation. And it's something that's been working its way through the community for a number of years. And the state is very excited about it. It's a comprehensive bill. It's about 197 pages that regulates all sorts of marijuana industry and enforcement and taxation for the state of New Mexico. Now, this is HB2. It does refer specifically to the state of New Mexico, so the tribes aren't subject to it, but two points for tribes. One, on one of the regulatory committees that's advising the state government on how to implement this law, there will be a tribal representative, so the tribe's voices will be heard uh, on the state side. Additionally, the law authorizes the state to compact with the tribes, very similarly to gaming, so that they may enter into agreements with the tribes if the tribes enter into the marijuana industry. So there's actually going to be a symbiotic relationship between states and tribes. Kale, does this uh, ring a bell? Does this sound like what Washington State has done uh, almost 10 years ago? Uh, yeah, it's very similar to what we saw here in Washington State, where the state, on the one hand, legalized marijuana and created its own regulatory scheme. And the legislature also authorized the executive branch to enter into compacts with Washington state tribes that allow the tribes to act as the primary regulators for marijuana on their own tribal lands. But through the compacts, they are able to work collaboratively with state regulators to allow those two marketplaces to interact so that tribes can purchase from state licensed growers and a tribe who chooses to grow can sell to state licensed retailers. Um, that's been a huge uh, component of what has made the marijuana industry so successful for tribes here in Washington state and that they get to enter into a larger marketplace and that ability to compact and be a part of that marketplace um, puts tribes uh, on an equal footing and in many ways even more advantaged than state licensees. So tribes are not state licensees in Washington? In Washington state, no. Tribes are licensed by uh, the tribal governments and different tribes can set up their own licensing schemes. Again, as a part of the compacting, there is interactions with the state regulatory agencies in order to ensure that, um, again, that the industries are able to interact, that marijuana is being tracked between those uh, licensed entities. But the state is not the primary regulators. They are uh, collaborative regulators um, that listen to the tribe's regulators. And the tribe's regulators would have to do things like background checking the, the uh, key employees of the, of the marijuana shops. Uh, is, there, is there law enforcement component, a uh, policing component? Absolutely. Um, you know, you're creating a whole new industry and a new sector on your tribal lands. So there's a lot of code work and administrative and regulatory work that a tribe has to do before you enter into this space. Um, you need to create your own standards. You know, how much marijuana are you allowed to sell? How is it going to be enforced? You need to revisit your criminal codes to make sure that those are updated. Uh, so there's a lot of regulatory and legal work that goes into this before you put up a shop. 
And again, it's going to depend on how far do you want to go? How fast do you want to go? Um, ensuring that if you were to grow, that you're testing your marijuana and that it's safe to consume. Uh, whereas some tribes don't want to go into that sector and maybe don't want to spend the time to do that work. And you can do a little bit less if all you're going to do is sell on your reservation. So it's really going to depend on what sector of the marijuana industry a tribe is interested in getting into and tailoring its codes to allow that. I think a lot of the times tribes think or many people think of marijuana as just growing and selling, but it's important to realize that there are a lot of ancillary businesses to the marijuana industry that might interest a tribe. In addition to growing, there is processing, packaging, that's a major component of the marijuana industry today, and testing. In Washington state, there is a tribe that has its own marijuana testing facility, and they are actually licensed not just through the tribe, but they have a state license that allows state licensees to get their marijuana tested on tribal lands. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for tribes in the marijuana industry that aren't just growing and selling. Okay, there, there is a question from our audience and I, I think it's a great one. Does Washington limit the number of state licenses that it issues? State of Washington, is there a limit to the number of state licensees? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, so from the state side of things, yes, there are a limited number of marijuana licenses that the state um, regulatory agency is authorized to give at any one time. And those licenses are actually in very high demand. Um, there's a very long waiting list if a non-tribal entity wanted to enter the marijuana space it's going to be years before they're able to get a license. Um, and those licenses are very valuable. People who already have them are able to sell them for crazy prices. One advantage that tribes have is that again, in Washington state, they are not licensed by the state. So um, they don't have to worry about those waiting lines. When Soxhawatl decided to open up its dispensary, it was able to go from sort of the idea of, yes, the tribal council has decided to get into this to having a fully open shop that is selling marijuana in less than a year. And that's just not going to be feasible um, for a state licensee. So tribes can move quickly in this space, definitely, and are, again, have several advantages over state licensees um, in terms of how quickly they can move, what kind of products they can sell, and how they can sort of outcompete um, their state licensed competitors. Great. Now, despite these uh, the federal memos that laid out priority actions and sort of a, a roadmap for what not to do, really, because you would go down that coal memo and it, it, it includes factors like, um, well, you got to make sure that the money's not going to organized crime. You got to make sure that your product is not going to minors. You got to, there's several different things. So tribes can follow that, but it's no guarantee that there is going to be a um, hands off approach by the federal government. It's only uh, a, a guide uh, at best. And so um, I think tribes are rightfully concerned by not only direct federal enforcement, but also the federal response in general, like like other agencies, BIA, HUD, other federal agencies that your EPA you're dealing with, what if these federal agencies are aware that the tribe has begun um, a marijuana operation that under federal law is illegal? Has there been pushback? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, another great question. Um, so again, the I have to preface this with the same caveats that Sophie was giving that it is still illegal under federal law and federal policy can sort of change at the whims of administrations. So I can only say what's happened so far and it's impossible to predict, you know, 2024, if we have a new administration, what that administration might choose to do. But what we've seen so far is that, again, tribes that are generally following those coal factors and are um, being responsible regulators are not seeing a lot of federal pushback for the most part. Um, that there are just too many other things that the federal government has to worry about and tribes, particularly in areas where marijuana has been legalized at the state level uh, are just not at the top of that priority list. I think that um, it's important for tribes to 
act as responsible regulators to consider uh, your obligations to your uh, to any federal contractors that you have. You know, if you have a BIE school, for instance, on your reservation, you probably don't want to put a dispensary, you know, within 200 feet or something like that of your school. That might get the attention of the federal government. But tribes are generally acting as very responsible primary regulators and are not looking to, you know, create uh, uh, problems for their community. They, they want to act responsibly. And I think that the federal government is receptive to that. And Jeff, just to give you a little more context about when enforcement has happened, under the Colin Wilkinson memos, marijuana prosecutions actually dropped significantly. And even during the Trump administration with the rescission of those memos, it's still, uh, marijuana prosecutions still remained lower than ever before. Uh, some marijuana prosecutions did happen against tribes in Wisconsin and Georgia. And significantly for this conversation, it did occur in 2017 against the Pickery's Pueblo, where 36 plants were removed from the Pickery's Pueblo, which they were growing for medical marijuana. And they had been very open about it, but they hadn't gotten any sort of state or tacit federal approval to grow those plants as sort of a test run. And so they were raided and those 36 plants were taken away and destroyed. No prosecutions or arrests were made from that raid, but it certainly put a damper on things. Uh, and that sort of sent a chill down everyone's spine when that happened. But I want to mention that when that raid occurred, the New Mexico Department of Health Secretary said in, in articles uh, talking about the prosecution, or excuse me, the raid, that she did not know of any scientifically valid use of marijuana and she did not support marijuana legalization at all. And obviously it was also under Jeff Sessions who was adamantly opposed to any sort of marijuana legalization. So when that raid happened in 2017, you had both a very hostile state government and a very hostile federal government. And we are in rather different footing now where we have a friendly state government and a not, not necessarily friendly federal government, but certainly a not hostile federal government. And so I think the tribes are really in an advantageous position right now. Kale, do you want to answer one of these questions from the Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. We've got really great questions coming in and I encourage um, everybody watching to feel free to keep um, asking them. Um, so I will um, dive into some of the most recent questions. So the last one we got was asking if any tribes who are grant funded have lost their $638. And I will say that that was a major concern for Soxhawatl where I previously worked because they are primarily a 638 tribe. Um, as you heard in the video segment, they're very rural. Um, they have not been able to have a successful gaming operation that many tribes use to um, get away from those $638. And that was that was a major concern, certainly, of the Tribal Council, and one was one of the reasons why they were comparatively late entering the marijuana game compared to a lot of their sister tribes um, who were less reliant on the federal government. Um, so to answer that, I would say that I haven't heard of any tribes who have lost their $638, and that hasn't been something that I've seen here in Washington State. Um, I do have to, again, preface that um, everybody is taking a bit of a risk if you enter this space, that the federal government could always change its mind in the future, and that's just something that every tribe is going to have to face in deciding what risks they're comfortable taking and um, what risks they're not comfortable taking. So up to this point, um, that's not something that we've seen, and I would be very surprised if we started to see that under this administration. But again, until Congress acts, um, it's impossible to say what a future administration might choose to do. That being said, there continues to be efforts in Congress um, to push legislation that changes the federal status of marijuana. The MORE Act um, has already passed the House this year and is in the Senate. Um, you know, the Senate is having trouble passing any legislation, but certainly everyone in this space is watching that carefully. Um, the SAFE Act is... Um, to allow banking in the marijuana industry. So there's a lot of public um, pressure to for Congress to act and there are bills moving through Congress. 
that's something that everyone in the industry hopes to see because that will really provide certainty for the entire industry, but especially for tribes. I'll take a question and let Kill uh, take a little break. And it is that, what about transporting product on the tribal lands? If, uh, if you are in a state, I think this question goes to, uh, if, if tribes in a state without a, a legal licensed marijuana industry, uh, because in Washington, for instance, this is not a problem. You can just uh, contract with any number of state licensed transporters, growers, what have you, and get your product onto tribal lands. But if you're in a state that doesn't have that kind of um, uh, system set up, and in fact may be adverse to it, whereby uh, you have state police who are um, out to, to stop shipments of marijuana over state lands, then what is a tribe to do? And that's absolutely a, a, a genuine challenge for those tribes. That's why we said, I think, at the, toward the beginning, that it's great to be a, a seed to sale tribe in that type of uh, situation where you can be entirely uh, self-reliant on Indian lands. I might also say that in Oklahoma, for instance, most of Eastern Oklahoma is now considered Indian country. So you, there are some opportunities there. If one tribe were to take on one uh, sector of the industry, uh, that could be transported entirely on Indian country uh, uh, to another tribe, another reservation. So uh, there may be opportunities there when you have contiguous tribal Indian lands. Uh, but if you don't have that and you're an isolated reservation, then yes, I think that's a serious problem uh, and, and states might, um, might pose a significant um, obstacle for that kind of uh, 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 industry. And we would say if you want to try it, it should be seed to sale on, on tribal lands. Kale, is there another question up? Yes, um, we've got a couple more questions. I'll go to a question from Blue because it's been sitting there for a little while about how tribes are addressing counterfeit products. And uh, certainly that is something that the marijuana industry has seen for a long time. And I would answer that by saying that most tribes are um, acting the same ways that the states do. Um, they have, uh, of course, every tribe is different, but they create a regulatory system where marijuana that is sold on their properties is tested for a variety of um, contaminants and THC levels to ensure that the products that they're selling, um, that they know what they're selling to consumers. And that is, I would say, critically important, both from a business perspective that you want to know as a supplier what you're selling, its potency, so that you can make recommendations to customers and as a regulatory agency to know that the safety, I mean, ultimately these are consumable products that um, don't have you know, FDA regulations because the federal government um, still has it illegal. So it's critically important that any tribe entering this space take those into consideration and create robust regulatory systems to ensure the safety um, of their products and the authenticity and, uh, of any products that they get. I'll take one now. Uh, intellectual property and uh, cannabis industry. Uh, it's a very great question because every every industry is going to want to protect the intellectual property around the marketing uh, uh, packaging of, of these products, even patents uh, as you develop new strains and what have you. The, the deal, though, is that these are federal laws uh, that you take advantage of in intellectual property. And that, that those federal laws will not merge well with the uh, Controlled Substances Act and the fact that marijuana is illegal under federal law. So those, those uh, intellectual property statutes are of no help. They will not um, allow you to, for instance, register the trademark on a retail marijuana product. Uh, it, we're going to have to wait until the Congress changes the, uh, the statute and that is no longer a federally illegal use. Um, Kale, I don't know if you have any, Sophie, any, anything to follow up on that with? A little bit. I do know some tribes and Pueblos are, for instance, the Pickeries Pueblo, one, they were growing those 36 plants as a test run for medical marijuana. And I believe the Acoma Pueblo had a larger operation as well. I'm not sure the status of it that began in about 2017. So tribes certainly are working towards having their own medical and scientific research and uh, working on their own plant breeding. Uh, I don't think that's been an area that has been entered into quite as much as some of the other marijuana industries, but I think it would be an excellent one for tribes to control their own needs for their own communities. 
I guess that I would just tack on to that question. Um, you know, it's not really the focus of today's webinar. We're really focused on the marijuana industry when it comes to cannabis. But just to mention that um, industrial hemp has, of course, a completely different legal status. And that is an area where due to that change, um, it's possible to start exploring protections in the cannabis space, albeit just from an industrial hemp side of things, including the ability to patent strains. Um, but again, the, that's going to be hemp. So it's going to have a low THC content, but that's certainly an area that I think we're going to see a lot more tribes entering into. Um, but again, I don't want to get uh, too bogged down in hemp. That's a topic for another day. Right. Very good. We'll do another webinar on hemp. But speaking of other webinars, we do have another one planned already. And uh, Sophie's going to tell us a little bit about that before we say goodbye here. Sophie? Absolutely. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, my previous life involved working with tribal governments and their child welfare systems. And I often saw and worked with children and families who were connected to multiple tribes. So a case might be in one tribe's court, but there were certainly other tribes involved in the family's lives. And whether or not that child was eligible to be formally enrolled in another tribe or just had that heritage, it was important to take into consideration what the multiple tribal affiliations uh, might look like in that child's life and how they should be formally recognized by one tribal court or another. And so on August 31st, we will be putting on a webinar to talk about that, some considerations for tribal courts and practitioners. I was a guardian ad litem in that space and was able to view things from that perspective. Uh, Kale has some other experience from that perspective as well, actually representing tribes in those matters. And I think we'll be able to have a wonderful conversation about ways tribes can honor multiple lineages for their children. Great. Thank you very much. I was going to say goodbye, but we got a great question in the door and I got to take it. It says, what's the major distinction between an Indian tribe and any other person or group that wants to break into this business? other than the benefits financially to the tribe and control. Um, I'll take the first stab at it. Uh, any other person or business that's going to enter this space does so um, under the state law. And uh, in every state that has legalized marijuana use, you have to be a licensed uh, and taxed um, entity that, 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 that works in that industry. Now, tribes uh, are able to create their own laws, and uh, sometimes they can form, mirror the, the state um, uh, law around them on marijuana, but it doesn't have to be so. Uh, there can be small changes, uh, it can be radically different. Uh, and so the tribes have more um, uh, leeway in that, in that respect. Also, Kale mentioned that the state of Washington anyway limits the number of those state licenses given out to those other entities. And so um, any other person in Washington is gonna have to compete and probably pay handsomely for a license. Whereas tribes uh, create their own law and hand out their own license to their own entity uh, or private business if that's what they should, should choose. So there's really a lot more opportunity for tribes. They may not have you know, the most urban locations, but as we saw with Sox, Seattle, that's actually kind of a benefit because all the state licensed uh, sellers go to the urban areas and the competition is fierce there. Uh, and that leaves the uh, rural areas completely devoid of marijuana retail and tribes can step into that space and do very well. Kill anything to add to that? Yeah, I guess I would just add that I think that you really hit on it that as a sovereign nation, tribes can create their own rules and regulations and that those don't always have to mirror the states. So it's going to depend on where a tribe is located and what the state's laws look like to think about what a tribe might want to do differently. For instance, here in Washington state, um, you know, we got to show some of the great pictures of the tribal operations. And if you walk into a state licensed operation, it's going to look very different because under state law, you can't sell a lot of the paraphernalia. So you can't buy a pipe at a state licensed operation. Um, they can't sell CBD products there um, for, for hemp products. So tribal operators are able to bring all of that under one roof basically. And state operators aren't able to do that. Um, another area where tribes I think are under haven't taken full advantage of this yet, but financing. Um, 
We haven't talked about it today, but it's very difficult to enter into the marijuana space from a financing perspective because banks generally are not willing to work in the marijuana industry due to uh, federal regulations. So it's hard to find local credit unions or um, card processing facilities that are willing to work in the marijuana space. And tribes as sovereign governments who can create their own laws and who have experience um, in Indian country in the financial sector between gaming, lending, and a variety of other um, financial uh, institutions in Indian country, um, there's a real opportunity for tribes as well to consider getting into it from a financing side and not having to worry about uh, creating its own financial regulatory system to help uh, support marijuana across Indian country uh, nationwide. So that that sovereign authority that tribes have just gives a lot of um, a lot of ability for tribes to experiment and to have sort of an edge on on the state system. All right, great. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and, and helping us get through this interesting topic. This is just a, we could go on forever. And uh, we do encourage you to get in contact with us if you have any other questions. In a second, uh, our contact information is going to pop up onto the screen. And there it is. So um, feel free to give us a ring or an email and uh, let us know what's on your mind. And we'd be uh, great, great to hear from you. Sophie, thank you very much. Kale, thank you very much. And our thanks to the tribal leaders and operators out in Washington who helped us with that great video too. We really appreciate it. Thank you everybody, so long, bye-bye.